Today I am going to share something with you that comes from the heart. Because you see, I have a confession to make. Not many people know this about me, but I love rocks. I love rocks because they contain so much strength and so much mystery. I mean, they last for thousands upon thousands of years, and while at first they may appear to be dull and boring, if you break them open, sometimes they reveal immense beauty. So when I was a child, one of my favorite things to do was to go out on the dirt road that we lived in, lived on, and look for interesting rocks. I would then take them underneath the patio where my hideout was and take other rocks to break them open. It took every ounce of strength I had to get those rocks to split, but when they finally did, I was usually rewarded with glistening colors and sparkles that gleamed back at me. So as I grew up, my mom thought, or should I say hoped, that I would outgrow my love of rocks. But guess what? I didn't. Instead, it just intensified. In fact, many years ago, when I went to the Middle East, I didn't bring back the traditional souvenirs of t-shirts and jewelry. No, I brought back rocks and ancient pottery that was scattered all over the ground. So much so, that my suitcase that weighed 27 pounds the day I left had grown to a whopping 53 pounds for the return trip home. Now, perhaps the reason that I brought so many rocks and pottery home is that I found that each piece represented a timeless piece of history because these rocks had lived through the time of the Bible and yet they were still around to fascinate me. For example, let's take this rock here. This rock means more to me than just about anything that I own. Because this rock comes from the top of Mount Sinai, and I climbed Mount Sinai all night long in the dark just to watch the sun rise. Now, had I shown you this rock without the story to go with it, you'd have probably just thought it was some rock out of the Texas Hill Country. But now that you know a bit of its history, I can also, since you can't quite see it, share some of the memories that are on it. First, there are fossils of prehistoric plants embedded into the sides of it. The top has been chipped, letting us know that it was broken off a larger piece of rock, and it actually sparkles with limestone underneath. Not to mention, I think it kind of looks like the Ten Commandments, <laughs> which is why I lugged it all the way down Mount Sinai and home. But just think of what this rock has lived to see. You know, I've said it twice now. I've talked about a rock living. Now, they may not live and breathe and talk and think like we do, but rocks have existed. This, think about it. This rock has existed for thousands of years, made by our Creator, and was on Mount Sinai before Moses placed his feet upon the mountain. We even have proof because it has life itself embedded onto its sides. You know, the first time I ever heard this passage from 1 Peter preached was on that same trip to the Middle East. It was the second to the last day, and I was so tired. I had climbed mountains. I had scaled ruins. I had done digs, archaeology digs. I had literally seen hundreds of ancient places, and I hadn't washed any of my five changes of clothes in three and a half weeks. I also had ridden three camels. So yes, I was tired, 
and I stunk like a camel. It was Sunday morning and we were sitting on some stone benches in a garden when our Professor Andy began his final devotion of the trip. As I sat and waited, I was, of course, kicking the rocks beneath my feet. But my eyes were locked on an outcropping of stone that had been turned into a tomb, the garden tomb, the place that is believed that Jesus lay dead for three days before the resurrection. The air was still and silent except for the singing of the birds and the shuffling back and forth and back and forth of my feet over the rocks. And he began his devotion by reading this passage and comparing it to all the ancient and modern places we had been over the previous 27 days. And he even compared this passage to my impressive collection of rocks that I had gathered while on the trip. Yet when the words came out of his mouth, now you are coming to Jesus like a living stone. I was struck to my inner core because suddenly these words had a new and amazing meaning in a new and powerful way. Come to Jesus like living stones. And as I sat and I listened to Andy's words and stared at the opening of this tomb, which was made of the strength of stone and yet still could not hold our Savior, I suddenly realized something. I realized that while I am on this earth for a very, very short time, I need to live my life as a Christian and have my faith grow to be as strong and enduring as stone. A stone that is alive in the world today. A stone that goes out and serves others, but also helps lay the foundation for the future generations that are to come. You know, when Peter first preached these words to the people, he was speaking to an audience they had no clue what the living, breathing body of Christ called the church was all about. These saints that he preached to, they were beaten down and persecuted, and they were tired too. For so long, they had been stones on the road of life, being crushed under the chariots of an oppressive government, and they were merely existing and struggling to survive. But then Peter comes along and he introduces them to this man named Jesus Christ and tells them about his gospel. And suddenly, new life, filled with passion, began to stir in them, bringing these dead stones to life. And they dedicated themselves to building the spiritual house that Peter talks about the, cha- the house that we now call the church of Jesus Christ. You see, Peter knew that they didn't have to have all the perfect qualifications to be a disciple. He knew they had to have passion for Jesus. So he met them right where they were in all of their delusionment and fatigue and empowered them to believe that they, if, if they obediently followed Jesus, he would bring them abundant life. Peter did it by showing them that in the eyes of the world, the world thought that they were a nobody. But in the eyes of Jesus, they were the chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, people who were God's own loved possession, a people who now were being called to go out and speak of these wonderful acts of Jesus, the one who had brought them from darkness into light. Once these people were like so many in our world today, they were nobodies. But now they were God's chosen people, and God had work for them to do. So throughout the rest of his message, Peter goes on to challenge them over and over to ignite 
the passion within their souls that they have for Jesus and his church. Telling them that Jesus is calling them to use the gifts and talents that God gave them despite all their crazy, quirky habits. And that Jesus had a place for them in this spiritual house that was being built by Jesus. And the best part was, Peter says, this spiritual house that Jesus is building, unlike human structures, it's never going to fall, it's never going to break apart, and it's never going to die. Because until he comes again, Jesus is the cornerstone. Peter's words challenged these new disciples to a newer, richer, stronger life of discipleship. And those faithful saints, if you think about it, they followed the call. Because they became the rocks within the mortar that was the foundation of of what we call the church of Jesus Christ. And they are the reason we are sitting here today welcoming some new disciples. A church that has survived for over 2,000 years. You know, there's a famous story about a Spartan king who was boasting to a visitor about the walls of Sparta. However, when the visitor began to look around... He didn't see any walls. And the visitor said to the king, Your Excellency, I have heard for many years that your walls are strong, but I cannot see any. Can you explain? To which the king replied, You see, my friend, in Sparta, every person is a brick. Then the king began to point to all of those who were around him. These, my friend, he said, these are the living walls of Sparta. Friends, when it comes to the church of Jesus Christ, every single believer is a brick. They are a living stone, one of the stones that God is building into a spiritual house in the world. This means that sometimes we get stuck and we don't stay living stones. Life gets in the way and we pull back from our discipleship. And here Jesus is saying, I need you to stop. And I need you to be those living stones. Don't serve as a spectator in the church, but as an active, faith-filled participant It's so easy in the life of the church to become an armchair quarterback. But it's another thing altogether to be down on the field with the team. And Jesus says, if you want to be a living stone for me, you got to be down and engage on the field with the team. Today we are going to joyfully celebrate as these six young people publicly proclaim for themselves that Jesus Christ has sought them out and called them to become full disciples and members of this church. These six have spent the last six weeks alongside their adult mentors who have attended every single class with them, learning what it means to be a disciple for Jesus. Kate and Michael and Corianne and Katie and Bella and Jeremiah, friends, they are living stones in Christ church. Just like those early disciples, they have the passion to serve Jesus inside of their souls. And as you even heard Jeremiah say, he is thankful for worship because it has become a priority for them. They are excited about stepping into Christ church alongside of us and digging their feet deeper into the life of discipleship but to empower them in their discipleship as living stones, they need the rest of us to be living stones around them, teaching them, empowering them, learning from their dedication to Christ, and then serving alongside of them. Therefore, as we prepare to bring these young people as full disciples into Jesus' church called Grace, Everyone over the age of 14 has a challenge. I want you to think of your answers to these questions that the youth have been learning about. 
How are you doing in your life of discipleship? Are you choosing to be a living stone, choosing to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and go out and actively invite other people into the church of Jesus Christ? Or are you choosing to be a stone that lays dead along the path? Are you a living stone that joyfully says, yes, Jesus, use me? When Jesus or Christ's church calls out to you to serve, or are you more willing to say, I've done my time, pick someone else? Is worship and study and service to Jesus as a living stone the number one priority in your life? Or has it just fallen down somewhere on your to-do list? I ask these questions today because Jesus needs every single soul in the Grace family to come alongside these young disciples, to come alongside one another and grow grace into the family, the spiritual house that Jesus has designed it to be. Jesus is his cornerstone, and he will never, ever let this house fall. But he needs us to be the active living stones that grow out and build it into his dream for this church, both for these disciples now and forevermore. Brothers and sisters, listen and hear. The challenge is before you right now. The challenge is that comes to us in Scripture. Come to him like living stones and let yourself be built into a spiritual house. For once, you were not a people. But now, you are God's people. Precious and chosen in God's sight. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you call us to be your living stones. And like those disciples from so long ago, so often we're tired. And we become like stones lying dead on the side of the road. And yet you have promised us the fullness, the beauty, and the abundance of life if we follow you. So on this day where we welcome new disciples into your church called Grace, may each of us also say, yes, Lord, use me. May we ignite a passion for you within these walls and beyond, actively seeking new disciples, growing them in faith, and then serving them, sending them out to be your hands. Breathe your spirit within our souls this day. In your name we pray. Amen.